Polish press. <laughs> Masechus A.D. Uh, J. How's it go? I'm uh, your A.M. D. A.M. D.G. Gloria. Yeah. Right. Okay, I think we'll get underway. You ready? Yosef, you ready? All right. Well, right, we're set to go. Okay, fine. Hello? How's the sound? This, this is not working. Hello? Hello? The microphone's not on. Huh? I don't touch anything. And p fix the two uh, speakers, right? Instead of helping people mess it up. I, I believe anything. And once the kids walk with these things, they... So it's really weird. How is it? Hello? Hello? Yosef, can you hear? Can you hear? Okay. Okay. Hello? I think you might make this a little bit louder. Are they both working? Okay. Okay. Can we make this? A, can can you all hear me? And at the back, you can hear what I'm saying. That's that's no good. Mickey, you can hear what I'm saying. Okay. Fine. Okay. Fine. In that case, good to The Devach, we're, uh, tonight we're going halfway uh, through the series, as you know. I start, as I always do, by thanking Shemri Amuna. And also the RZA for covering a whole series like this. A chance to see and uh, in, in hold a microscope up. Tonight we're really going to hold a microscope up. And uh, the particular sponsor tonight I want to give a hand to, this is my uh, student and uh, good friend, Dr. Marth Friedman. You all know the Friedman sitting here in the audience. As you see, he put it in honor of uh, close friends of his, uh, from Chicago, Dr. Arthur and Mrs. Uh, Cohn and all their children, who I'm told are big uh, supporters, uh, big philanthropists, apparently, in Chicago. And anyway, the words of the inscription speak for themselves. And uh, I'm always very honored to have people like that associated with, uh, with my talks and uh, have students I still keep up with. Um, and I just hope we'll be able to continue this in, in, in the future and everything should go well for everybody. Tonight, i really operating on high tech, Howard. Uh, Alabama's in London, right? Edward R. Murrow. <laughs> uh, but he is in uh, close satellite contact at this moment with Jake Shuchman. And everything we say is being watched very closely by Interpol. <laughs> so watch, watch what you shout from the audience because you will be uh, examined by the police. I do want to thank everybody. Uh, Yosef here is manning the uh, show over here tonight. Um, make sure we get all the pictures here. And now, without any further ado, I'll get down to uh, brass tacks because all the others don't want to be mentioned. Tonight, as you know, we're uh, ha doing halfway uh, through the series, 7 out of 14, the seventh lecture of this uh, era called the uh, Ben-Gurion era at high noon. I hope by now you see that I don't have to keep repeating myself. There is a very definite character to the late 50s. Um, in Israel, Israel and the Jews, 1957 to 61. Tonight, I entitled The Irresistible Force versus the Immovable Object. Israel and the Arab World in the Age of Nasser. And uh, I hope to make the case uh, tonight uh, we're spending a lot of time on context, that's what history is about. It's not just a matter of telling uh, stories or uh, facts or showing funny videos.
Israel uh, reacts to this. And without any further ado, I begin. If you're an Arab, what's it? Okay. Is it okay? Can you hear? It is good? I'm not talking to you. <laughs> you can <could> all. <laughs> they, is, it, is it okay? Okay, fine. If you're an Arab, um, I mean, even today, things have been bad in one fashion or other for a thousand years. Okay, so it's an interesting uh, perspective. If you're an American, you don't necessarily look at the past that way, but if you're an Arab, things have been bad for a thousand years. Uh, once upon a time, look what they uh, controlled, and this was a single country. Um, in the 600s and the early 700s, that's a long time ago, they conquered this huge area by force of arms, and they created a great empire with a single capital for a long time, for example, it was at Baghdad. And uh, in its uh, heyday, it was uh, gigantic, from India to the Atlantic Ocean, as you can see. Now, um, they created a whole civilization. In its heyday, Islam was a subordinate part of the Arab civilization, right? It was the face of Arab civilization. Now, I'm talking to you how an Arab looks at things. I'm not talking to you, for example, how an Indonesian who's a Muslim looks at things, right? I'm not talking to you possibly how an African from Nigeria who's a Muslim looks at things. I'm talking about if you're an Arab, particularly if you're an Arab Arab, like Arabia and those kind of places. So yes, Islam came along and Mohammed and all that, and yes, they conquered a huge empire, and yes, they brought this dramatic religion to the world, no question about it, but it was in Arabic. Mohammed spoke Arabic, the Quran is in Arabic. The uh, lands that they conquered, they Arabized, among other things, okay? The conquered countries, I means this whole area was not only Islamized, that is to say, not only did they spread over the course of time, it wasn't overnight, but over the course of time, the Islamic religion, but they Arabed everybody, you understand? So for example, take a look at the next picture, if we can. No, oh, I'm sorry, okay, great. He says, um, well, that's not exactly what I was looking for, but okay, does it, it's, it's fine. They, let, let me make the point. Here's Iran. You know that. At that time, Iran was actually even bigger. Think about what I'm about to tell you. The Arabs spent 20 years fighting to conquer Iran. The Persians fought like crazy not to be conquered by the Arabs. This in the 630s and 640s. Um, with a bloody business. And it didn't happen overnight. And when they conquered one part, the Iranians tried to counterattack. And the Persians were Zoroastrians. They weren't Arabs. They weren't Muslims. And they bitterly resented the imposition, number one, of a foreign religion on the land that had for a long time been Zoroastrian, the Persians. And number two, they bitterly resented the fact that some foreign group called the Arabs, who they really, from the Persian point of view, they really considered sand jockeys. That is what they looked at them like. That they're coming in now and conquering us. You understand? And so uh, it wasn't an easy business. In the end, they did conquer the Persians, and they did shove it down their throat, the Arab language, and uh, the Islamic religion, and the Arab culture, and everything goes along with that. And to a certain degree, the Persian culture was suppressed. So if you lived in the 700s, 800s, and all those uh, hundreds in that part of the world, it wasn't speaking Iranian much anymore, a little bit. But basically, it was all Arab. But the Iranians hated this. And after a while, even in the Middle Ages, they sort of found the opportunity culturally to counterattack culturally and to bring back the Persian stuff. So they didn't get rid of the religion stuff. And actually, Iran, believe it or not, was a Sunni country for many centuries. So many don't know that. So he says, uh, they did keep the religion stuff, but they did get rid of what they called the foreign invading colonialist Arab stuff. So I'm simply trying to give you an example of a country, and a very important one. In world affairs today, I don't have to tell you, the whole Arabs are quaking from Iran because they're getting a bomb. But I'm trying to show you that even though we think, oh, it's all one big Muslim blob and all the rest, it's, it's not exactly like that. And they're very important uh, language and cultural distinctions uh, that, that, that matter a lot in the Middle East. And uh, the, Mos the, the uh, Iranians are very proud of the fact that they kicked the Arabs the heck out of there. Um, and it shows you that uh, if Iran is a country, and there are a couple others, when I say Iran, it's, it's also uh, uh, other part, Afghanistan, Pakistan, the other stands over there, they all have this in common, what I just told you, they were Arabizing and they threw the Arabs out of there. 
So they did retain the Muslim religion, but they did not re retain uh, the Arabic language. But that means, by, by uh, co contrast, that all the other countries failed to do what I just described to you. As the Egyptians were not able to do, it didn't happen in Egypt, what I just described you happened in Iran. They never did get rid of the Arabization stuff, or the Syrians, or the Iraqis, if you wish, or the Moroccans, or the Algerians, and so forth. So all this stuff matters. And when we will talk today, for example, about an Arab world, what do they mean by that term? It's, it's where Arabic is spoken, and the Arab language, the Arab uh, uh, literature, and Arab uh, culture is still there, which was shoved down their throat once upon a time. But these other countries were culturally too weak to sort of counterattack and fight back bitterly the way the Iranians did. Now, the Arabs, during the golden era, meaning when they ruled everything and shoved down everybody else's throat, and I'm using the Arabs in the very widest sense of the term, because they'll call Arabs anybody who spoke Arabic and participated in the Arab culture. Uh, usually it was Muslims, but there were very important uh, Arab Christian groups who did very important cultural things among them. Uh, the Arabs created a glorious civilization. We know you can't deny it. Uh, uh, sciences, you know, math, uh, arithmetic, as we call it, the Arab numbers, algebra, <laughs> maybe you've heard of, um, and, and, and astronomy, and geography, and history, and, and all kinds of things happened very often by non-Muslim Arabs. That is, they usually Christian and Jews who spoke Arabic, different part of the Arab culture, which is interesting. But there are a lot of Muslims that did also. I don't want to discriminate over here. And if you're an Arab living today, you know, whether in, in the West Bank or in Syria or in Egypt, and all, especially if you're an intellectual, you have any kind of culture to you, oh, you know all about this stuff, and this was Givaldic, and everything was going great in those days. Uh, the Arabs, especially the Arab Arabs, could not help but view themselves as a master race because that's what they did. They conquered such a huge area, and as I just pointed out, they imposed their stuff on everybody else, not the other way around. So don't think the Arabs have a self-image the way Americans often think of Arabs, which is a third world group and they're behind and they're backwards and all the rest. That's not their self-image. It's one of which we are the glorious ones and at least in the time of our forefathers, we kicked everybody else. And we showed thereby our superiority and therefore everything about us is glorious. So for example, the Arabs in the Middle Ages threw a great deal of interest in the study of the Arabic language, grammar, poetry, before anybody else did in their own, own cultures. Uh, why? Because the Arab language is so self-evidently beautiful that it, it, that, that it repays the, luxuriantly the closest study. So they invented dictum. The Jews were copying off of them. They invented poetry in the sense that we understand it today, and the Jews were copying off of them. Here's uh, Al-Kharizi, the famous Jewish poet my favorite, from the time of the Rambam, basically, who uh, has a very famous poem in his book, who was a master of Arabic and also master of Hebrew. I spoke about Michel a couple months ago, my mother's yard, sorry. The, the, uh, he was a master of all the languages, and uh, in fact, does amazing things in translations. Uh, for those of you here from the Yeshiva world, you know, he's the one who did the first translation of the Mornavuchim, and he's the one, when you open the Gemara, he's the, in, in the uh, Vilna Shas, he's the one who translated the uh, Pirish Mishnah, the, the Rambam was Rowan, you know, in Brachas and that sort of thing. Better translation, worse translation, but nevertheless. And he has a very famous poem that he starts the book with, which I don't remember exactly, but the point of it is, you know, there's this girl and this girl, and the Ar some represent the Arabs, and they're saying, we're the most beautiful, and this girl who represents the Hebrew language, say, no, 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 I'm the most beautiful, and I'm the one that should get the most attention. And he's simply trying, as a Jew, and a Jewish Jew, to compete or you know, culturally compete in an Arab world in which everything else is the Arab language. So this is the world of the Middle Ages. The uh, lower groups, the Jews, the Christians, were actually cultural enzymes. They produced a lot of translations and uh, new innovative ideas in science and, and technology uh, that the other Arabs were able to use and expand upon, sort of the way the Japanese have done with American technology. You see? Now, as I said, they didn't get everywhere, weren't perfect. Here, let's do the next one. The uh, places like Persia, you know, threw them out. But nevertheless, they were there for a while. 
Okay, now the story gets very interesting. As often happens, in fact, maybe always, empires have a tendency to spread until they overextend. Most Americans would agree we did that in the 20th century. That's why we're broke. We went too far. You know, looking back, shouldn't have gone to Vietnam, shouldn't have gone to Iraq, shouldn't have gone to this, you know, we spent a belt of money and got nothing out of it. You know, that, that attitude. Oh, overdid it, right? You know, now that we used to, when I was growing up, they used to teach you in the uh, high school books, the isolationists before and after war were all crazy. Now, to make a comeback, a lot of people say, oh, they should have listened to this Taft and the others. American wouldn't have, uh, you know, gone overseas, lost all the money. You know, we'd be better off today. There's the idea of overstretch. In the case of the Arabs, they couldn't help but keep fighting until they ran into overstretch. That's here, where I'm pointing right now. East of Iran, the stands, this is as far as they got. A Pakistan, Afghanistan, and some of the other, Turkestan. And the reason I'm saying that is that as they moved east, they ran into not small, easy countries to knock off like Egypt proved to be, or Syria but vast areas, which I just tried to describe you, fought back. And what happened is that they did conquer them, but they found themselves, a small group of Arabs, running a gigantic group of Persians, Turks especially, and all these type of people, what we call today Afghanistanians and Pakistanians and all the rest, and Pathans, Pashtun, this is a lot of people. And yeah, for a while, you know, the lady was riding the tiger. <laughs> But after a while, like in the famous limerick, the smile is on the face of the tiger. All right? And so at first, the Iranians and the Turks and these other far you know, eastern areas served the Arabs. But over time, and not a long time either, the Turks, who are these, let's go back one. The Turks who were up here in these areas, I mean, the Muslims were kind of amazing. They had battles in the middle of Russia, the Arabs did. You know, they went very far. But after a while, the way things developed, these Turks who were a conquered group and were Islamized, forced to, 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 to take the Muslim religion, emerged as the military caste within the Arab state. And the Arabs become the civilian caste. And we all know what that means. All right? So already from the time of the Caliph al-Mutasim, which is in the early 800s, that's a very early one in Arabic history. Muhammad died in 632. And this guy's around literally 200 years later, 832. By the time you get to this uh, uh, caliph who runs out of Baghdad, because he had a machlokas with his brothers who should take over and this and that and the other, he formed a special elite military unit of 4,000 Turks. And in his time, you know, he ran them. But after them, after his time, they ran him. Right? His children. And... The Arabs lost the military edge. The Turks were wild and crazy fighters, especially they were highly disciplined. And the, consequently, um, what happens is that already in the late 800s, late 800s, people don't know this, the Arabs were no longer the ruling class. The Turks emerged as the ruling class, different types of Turks within the Arab Empire. So it is that huge empire we saw before, but who's calling the shots? You see? And if you're an Arab, you know this. So already well over a thousand years ago, they lost it. Now, a Westerner doesn't see this because you say like this, well, it's all Muslim still, and they all talk funny languages, so what's the difference? You know? but, 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 but it's not true. You understand? This foreign group, so to speak, who were not Arabs at all, and who were sort of like imported from the conquered areas, at least they thought they conquered them, from the far reaches of, you know, by that time of Afghanistan and Russia and, uh, and, and, and you know, the stands that we call today, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, all this stuff. Um, they are the, uh, the bosses. And for the next 1,000 years, that's a long time, the Arabs will be the ruled and not the rulers. It's quite a statement I just made. And the average person doesn't know this, even though it's, it's basic history. The Arabs are the ruled and not the rulers. So they haven't really been in charge of anything, right? They haven't had an empire run by them since the ninth century, which is a long time. Now the people who were the real bosses did subscribe to Islam, and many of them did speak Arabic, many didn't. And they will respect the Quran being an Arab language and all that kind of business. And the Arabs will, within the ruled areas, totally pursue their culture, but they're not the bosses anymore. <laughs> That was in the 600s to 700s and early 800s. Uh, it was the Turks, for example, and the Kurds, 
who fought the Crusaders. Many people don't know that. You think it's the Arabs. The Arabs were nothing by this time. Saladin was a Kurd. All right? I don't know if you know. Yeah, it was from Kurdistan, the uh, Ayyubid uh, dynasty. Uh, and that's because when they wanted to have somebody, or if they emerged out of the Islamic world, somebody with a military skill and strength to fight the Crusaders, it ain't going to come from the, which I say, the wimpy Arabs. It's going to come from the uh, manly and uh, martial uh, you know, Kurds and, and, and Turks and that sort of thing. And this is, this is how it goes. Now, these people are Muslims, but they're not Arab. They speak a different language. And as time went on, they no longer regarded the Arabs as culturally superior, which is very much of a diss to the Arabs. By the 1500s, by the time you get to the end of the Middle Ages, um, the whole of Islam is ruled by two non-Arab peoples, the Persians and the Turks. Right? Isn't that interesting? Here are the two big rulers of the 16th century in Islam. Suleiman the Magnificent, who was a very powerful Turkish ruler. And here's Shah Abbas the first, who was very bad to the Jews, by the way. This guy was good to the Jews. This guy was bad to the Jews. Um, but aside from that, that's the guns of the Middle East. The Turks had what we would call today, uh, you know, uh, well, let's take a look at the next map. The whole of the Arab world is subsumed. Here's the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. And here's the Persian Empire at its maximum. So that's everything. <laughs> that's the whole Arab map I showed you before. Uh, he's not an Arab, the ruler over here. He's a Turkey. He could speak Arabic because he was educated, but he reads the Quran, for example, in Turkish. And the language of administration is Turkish. The, the poetry, and the, by the way, Suleiman was a big poet. He says the, 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 the law, the administration, the culture, the poetry, the literature, Turkish. Now, to you and I, I mean, but, but to them it does. And they were Kanakras. I want to show you something. Suleiman the Magnificent not only conquered Budapest, he got up to Vienna. Look at that. Um, that, that that's quite amazing. The Ottomans in their day were something, and so were the Persians. The Persians fought them, fought them off. These have battles constantly for centuries. The 1500s, the 1600s, and the, uh, up to half of the 1700s. Who should control Iraq? So uh, when the, uh, should the Persians control it, as they did in the time of the Gemara? Or should the Turks, the Western rulers, control it, as it was the time of the Romans? And eventually, you know, went back and forth. Eventually, the Turks won out after two and a half centuries of fighting. I mean, two and a half centuries of fighting. And Iraq, therefore, is, a, is an Arab country that speaks Arabic and not a Persian country that speaks Persian. But you can be darn sure you'll understand what I'm saying today. If you're the rulers today of Iran, uh, you want to make things right again. <laughs> so their, their goal is to annex... Iraq, which has a lot of Shiites anyway, and restore the way it should be. You follow? And so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Now, my point is that the Arabs don't play a role in this in, at the top level of power. They just live there. But the people with the power are either Persians or Turks. So it's actually very culturally uh, insulting. Uh, the Ottoman big shots were not Arabs usually. The Turkish Empire was run primarily... What, uh, yeah, Tur Turkish Empire, believe it or not, by people from here. Almost all the uh, grand viziers and big shots were from Christian origins and from Islamized family. You understand? Greek, Albanian, Bulgarian, Yugoslavian, Serbians. He, I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. All the guys who became the pashas and the big vizier, uh, Mahmoud Sokolo and all these guys, you look, who are they? Oh, the grand, the, either he himself was actually born as a Christian. I mean, just to give you an example, I don't want to bore you. Uh, Suleiman the Magnificent was this powerful Turkish ruler. His uh, prime minister was Pargali Ibrahim Pasha, who was, uh, I think, Greek, and just uh, converted as a child. And uh, ma no, I want to tell you. And he became the, the head of the uh, whole uh, Turkish Empire. And then he brought his parents, who were still Christians, and he built them a nice big house in Istanbul. And he, he like, not exactly, but like Yosef, they would say, I'm taking care of my family now, even though he himself stayed Muslim, because, of course, he's now part of the Turkish Empire. Where do the Arabs play a role in any of the stuff I just mentioned? They don't, you see? The Arabs are people effete, as they would see being seen by the Turkish, uh, into, into a religion, uh, you know, old times, uh, poetry, uh, literature, but, you know, and they come and they serve in the army also, but the real, you know, real men are Turks, <laughs> you understand? Or, or Balkan, Balkanized groups who are conquered by the Turks. Real men are Albanians, it's, it's, it's uh, Bulgarians, 
uh, to, you know, like, we, like we would call it in Yugoslavia, Serbians, and things like that. Uh, that's, that. That's where the action is. So that's quite a remarkable. Now, why did the Arabs revolt against this? First of all, you don't revolt against the Turks, <laughs> right? Uh, first they kill you, and then you have the trial. But second of all, <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't fool around over there. No, but it's also true. No, 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 hold on. Look at this map, right? Look at this map. The Turks justified their power by conquering a third of Europe. The old Arabs, when they ruled the empire, right, when the Arabs were in charge, they never got past here. You get it? They never got into Turkey. In the 600s, the 700s, the 800s, and even afterwards, the 9 and 10 hundreds, they were always stopped here by the Byzantine Empire, as they call it. And this was the limit of the Arab Empire. Look what the Turks did. They took over the whole Gansu Byzantine Empire. And they Islamized it. I mean, they, they ruled Budapest, you understand? They, they, in the Battle of Mohash, they conquered the whole Hungary. And they took over uh, Bud Budapest, was, was, a, was a Turkish town. And so the feeling was, God is obviously justifying them if they're carrying the banner of Islam to places where nobody else was able to do before. So they must be the ones, they're entitled to be the caliphs, and they were the caliphs of, uh, of Islam. So once again, is it a Muslim thing? Is it an ethnic thing? Now, the problem is that uh, then, eventually, the, the Europeans start to get stronger. And they start causing the Turks to lose ground. And then that success, which is the theological justification for the Turks being the rulers of the Arabs, starts to erode. You get to the great era when, you know, Sobieski, the king of Poland, uh, beats the Turks away from Vienna, and Prince Eugene of Savoy conquers Hungary, and the, uh, General Suvorov of Catherine the Great conquers uh, the Crimea and the southern Ukraine and those areas, and the Turks are on the losing side. They're, from now on, they never win a war. You know, not really. They always question of how much did they lose or how little. Um, that means that the Muslim, uh, they're, they're losing faith. I mean, uh, you know, look, look, look what they... Uh, Look what they had earlier, and then look over here. They're losing this, and they're losing over there. It's, it's, it's starting to erode in the 1700s. The loss of Hungary was a big sign that they're going to lose a lot. Here, uh, you don't appreciate it, but look at all this territory over here, and the Russians got it. You understand? This area over here was, was the Hungarian part, and the uh, Habsburgs got it. And it's the beginning of a, of a long phase that goes on for 200 years. Then comes the shock of Napoleon. In 1799, Napoleon landed an army in Egypt, and one, two, three, wiped out a bunch of Turkish armies, which already showed everybody that a good European army, led by a Napoleon-type guy, could easily conquer the Ottoman Empire. Right? So this state, which had been so powerful, all of a sudden is naked. The emperor has no clothes. It's very clear that if the British wouldn't bother him, Napoleon could take over the Turkish Empire. And if Napoleon could do it, so then if nobody will bother the Russians, the Russians could conquer the Ottoman Empire. Or the French, well, I just said that, or you know, some other European state like that. The only thing is, none of the European states trust each other, and so the British will block the Russians from taking over, and the Russians will block the British and the French from taking over, and welcome to the, to the politics of the 19th century, what used to call the Great Game, which is who, who takes over the Middle East. So what I'm trying to show you is that they lost a lot of face with the Arabs. Because, you know, why are you ruling us? You're not efficiently carrying forth the Islam banner anymore. Um, I mean, by the 1800s, they're really losing a lot of ground. Let's look, look at this. Here's what it was, and they lost everything in Europe. By 1914, they lost everything in Europe. They're left to what they have today. And instead of all this business, they, you, you, you see the picture. And so if you're an Arab, you interpret the loss that's constantly being suffered by the Ottoman Empire as a, a sign, either from God or from politics, maybe the Irish should be, have a tchis amesim, as a powerful uh, group. In the process, therefore, the Ottoman sultans lose the fear and the respect of the Arabs and their legitimacy. Okay, now, what are the results of this? And incidentally, this is all going to happen at the same time that another group called Zionism is starting. You follow? This is the problem. Two totally separate operations. The Jewish nationalism in its original nascent form will also start around the 1830s and 40s, and then will pick up steam, and it won't crystallize until the 1890s. But nevertheless, you have two groups coming out of completely different contexts that are starting to think of, what about us asserting our nationalism? 
uh, two movements will develop in the Middle East in the second half of the 1800s. First, a Muslim movement to warily reevaluate Western culture without admitting the inferiority of Islam. And so here you have two people that no one's ever heard of, unless you're a Muslim, who already in the 1800s are starting to say, listen, the Europeans are getting so far ahead of us, the Christians are getting so far ahead of us. Of course, the Europeans and the Christians are dogs and dirt, all the rest of it, but they're getting ahead of us. And so our attitude of burying our head in the sand and not being interested in what's going on outside the world of Islam and not too productive, maybe we should start to copy some of the stuff from the West, provided we do it in the right way. We want to be modern Orthodox. We don't want, God forbid, be Reform, you know? So, the, the, uh, no, I'm, I'm serious. And, you know, you can imagine there was a right-wing reaction against them and the left-wingers and so forth, but they have to catch up, otherwise the Europeans are going to just totally take them over. So there's one movement that starts in the Middle East, and that's a movement to try to westernize to a degree. Um, as you can see, these guys are pretty from, but they are nevertheless, nevertheless, they want to westernize uh, to a degree. Secondly, alongside of that, a distinctly Arab movement began among Arab intellectuals. They figured, look, the Ottoman Turks have screwed things up. The Arabs should have been kept low by the Ottoman Turks. The Arabs, if you define them as Arab speakers, which is controversial, but nevertheless, ought to now shake off the Turkish domination, form an Arab state, and usher in a new golden age which had, after all, been rudely interrupted by the uncivilized Turks a thousand years before. And here's a group of uh, this Arab Zionism, get it? You know, these, these are early, same time as Theodor Herzl, I mean it. The same time as Theodor Herzl, totally on their own, they're saying there should be an Arab nationalist movement. Now, most people aren't aware of the fact, they say, well, you were in the Arabs already. No, the Arabs lost their Arab stuff back in the 800s, you see? And they say, we want to cop it back and stop the clear decline of the Muslim world and of the Arab world and revive the glorious picture we had in the 600s and the 700s and the early 800s. Uh, now, in other words, as I just pointed out before, the nascent secular Arab nationalist movement began at the same time as the Jewish movement, meaning at the same time as the Chovei Sion and, and, and the Zionist movement, right? Here's the early form of Zionism, the Chovei Sion, and of course Herzl then took it to another place. Um, actually, they even look alike. <laughs> Don't they? And they're all, by the way, they're both operating at the same time, neither one knows about the other, or if they do, they don't care. You understand? And so anyhow, the early years, of the, look, it is, the early years of the 20th century, of the 20th century, complicate things even more if that's possible. In response to the loss of their European possessions, and the Turks were kicked out of all Europe eventually in the Balkan Wars that took place just before the First World War, they, Mamish got up to, you know, they, they threw the, the Turks out of everything, out of Bulgaria and uh, the lands that had been ruled by them for, for centuries. So what do you do now? You have a Turkish empire with nothing in Europe, which is where they used to get all their ministers and, uh, and, and, and smart people. Uh, and now all the Turks rule is a Muslim area. In response to the loss of the European possessions, Ottoman Turkish nationalists seized power from the Sultan and rules the young Turks. Meaning in 1900 there was a revolution uh, in which the Sultan who ruled Turkey one after the other for many centuries was not exactly deposed but was made a figurehead and instead a bunch of nationalist officers and intellectual types, they seized power. Now by the way, if you're an Arab today, if you go on the websites, they'll say this was a Jewish plot. Yeah, well, because in other words, it, it, it eventually leads to the downfall of the Ottoman Empire and to the rise of Zionism, so post hoc ergo propter hoc, you know, right? In other words, if, if this undid the Ottoman Empire, and next thing you know, you get the Balfour Declaration, obviously this was a Zionist plot. And, 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 and I, I know you laugh when you say it, it's amusing to me that everybody laughs because you're in a tiny minority. If you go online, TV shows and miniseries in the Arabic world, in the Arabic language, talk about this all the time, and it's like obvious to them. And, you know, they would consider you to be just, you know, ignorant beyond belief. That these young Turks push what they hope is a centripetal Ottoman nationalism opposed to an Arab nationalism. So they say like this, we have to create now a, a patriotism of the Turkish Empire. I, the Turks, are only one group and there's all these others. Everybody has to get with the program, <laughs> right? Everybody has to get to be a Turkish patriot. You understand? And, um, and whoever doesn't do that is no good. But if you do do that, 
If you say, I'll learn Turkish and I'll be very patriotic to the Sultan and I'll try to work for the greater glory of Turkey and all that kind of business and the Turkish Empire, then you'll be favored. Now, the Ottoman government therefore views the Arab nationalists as negative, as centrifugal, pulling apart. And so they hang them. Right? So um, it's kind of funny. The bitterest enemy, this is the irony of history. In the first part of the 20th century, between 1900 and 1914, the bitterest enemies of the Jews in Palestine get hanged by the Turks. You get what I'm saying? The, the intellectuals who start, the Arab intellectuals who start newspapers and say, don't sell to the Jews, they're trying to carry Kayamit as a big plot to take over the country, and uh, our number one foe is the uh, nascent Zionist movement, all the rest of it. They get hanged by the Turks because they're <laughs> not getting with the Turkish program. You know, so the Jews didn't tell them to do it, but they hang them, in fact, they used to hang them with Shariafo. I couldn't just find a picture of it. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's how it works over there. So, uh, act, as I said, this actually helped the Jews because uh, they were thinking, how can we go with the Turkish program to get the Turks to like us to facilitate Zionism? This is Ben-Gurion. Wow. <laughs> right? He went for a year or two to Istanbul. He never, had, he never went, went to school in his life. Let me just get that straight. Ben-Gurion never went to school. There's a lesson in there, but he never went to school. Uh, wait a minute. No, I'm wrong. He went for a year or maybe more to take courses in the university in Istanbul. And he did speak Turkish, by the way. Right? It's one of the, ben Gurion spoke English, sort of. He spoke Hebrew and Yiddish, and maybe another language, and Turkish. Now, he could curse in Russian, you know, but uh, now the, this, <laughs> but that's true of many. Now, um, wait a second. His idea was, as you know, he's a total Zionist, he says, learn Turkish, learn the Turkish thing, and then, armed with that knowledge, use it to make contacts with the Turkish administration in Palestine and help facilitate the Jewish cause. You understand? So uh, don't be surprised at this. Now, then came World War I, and in World War I, the, his, listen closely, the Turks were very brutal to the Arabs. Here's the uh, Turkish general, Jamal Pasha, who kicked a bunch of Jews out, but he killed, he didn't kick a bunch of, he killed by the thousands and tens of thousands Arabs. I'll say it again, he's a Turk, and the Arabs are his citizens, and they're all Muslims, and, they do, and, and, he, and he didn't fool, fool around. So the British, who were fighting the Turks, naturally said like this, divide the emperor, divide and conquer, why not? And so the British, if they're fighting them, they, they, the British will talk to the leader of the Arabs in Arabia, in what we call today Saudi Arabia, which at that time there was not Saudi Arabia, it was just Arabia, in Mecca and Medina, as Sharif Hussein. All right? And they say like this, hook up with the British, with us, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll fight the Turks, and it'll be good for both sides. And uh, he's old, so he sends his son Faisal to fight with Lawrence of Arabia. This is who Lawrence of Arabia is. The British officer that was sent to fight with the Arabs against the Turks. It's funny, right? They're, they're getting one group of Muslims to fight the others. Uh, the British, of course, uh, very much wanted this because uh, they didn't want, let me put it this way, when, when Turkey declared war in England in 1914, they also declared a jihad because the Sultan of Turkey happens to be the Caliph of Islam. And he therefore has the religious authority from the halakhic point of view of Islam to declare the British to be the objects of a holy war. And uh, there were hundreds of millions of Muslims in the British Empire. I'll give you just one example, India and Pakistan. Hundreds of millions. And the Turkish and German plan was that they should make a big uprising, which could have happened, and check the British. And they were scared to death of this in India, believe me. And there are many famous novels and books from that time about this, the Richard Haney stories. And um, the British said, well, no, we'll have a good counter against that. Because the guy who's the ruler of Mecca Medina, which is Sharif Hussein, he'll join the British. So that'll counter the jihad. So look how all this business is playing chess, right? Everybody's playing chess. Now, the British basically promised the Hashemite family, that's what they did from Hashem, and through them the Arab peoples, that if they helped the British win the war, a great Arab state, you hear what I said? An Arab state, not a Muslim state, we already had that, thank you. And when an Arab state will be created by the victor for the first time in a thousand years. The British promised that they'll make this an Arab country. You see how big it is, right? So it's all today, Israel and Syria and Iraq and all that kind of business. And you Arabs haven't had a country for a thousand years, right? So it's a good deal. Now, uh, it doesn't happen. Because when the First World War is over, the 
British basically shafted the Arabs, the British and the French. First they have the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and then you have, here you have, uh, this is, uh, does it work? Here's the Versailles Treaty, the, 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 com the, tr uh, the Conference at Versailles. Here's uh, uh, Faisal with a British officer and Lloyd George. And Lloyd George is giving them the bad news, you know. And, uh, and here's, uh, this is Balfour, right here. And he's got the message, he says, well, Palestine's actually going to the Jews, you know. <laughs> you get it? And uh, here's Woodrow Wilson, who's going to be a hypocrite to the Arabs, because he promised us that you have self-determination, and uh, since the Arabs are majority in the Middle East, so you should make an Arab country. And Woodrow Wilson is not going to go along with that. And so if you're an, an Arab, you see the Treaty of Versailles as a huge betrayal. If you're the ISIS or the Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, I mean, you know this very well, and you teach this to your children even today. So this is a betrayal not of Islam, as much, it is, but it, it's a betrayal of Arabs, get it? You promised us we'll have a big, one big Arab country, and we can go back to having a golden culture and a good old civilization like we had once before. But it doesn't happen. Instead of, Arab state, of an Arab state, they get a bunch of states whose borders were invented by the British and the French, and even these are not independent states. So the British and the French create Syria, they create Palestine, Later, of course, we know they subdivide Palestine into Jewish and Arab. Then they create Iraq. What's left? The Arabia is left. No, no, no. The Hashemite family gets kicked out of Arabia by the Saudis, if you can follow that. And so everything is all submished. And what happened to all the promises? Now remember, throughout their history, the Arabs had never, never been ruled by Europeans, by Christians, who they regard as their inferiors. You followed the story with me, hopefully, today. I told you a story from the 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 1800s. Never during those times were the Arabs ruled by people who were Christians or by Europeans. What happened was the Arabs started ruling themselves and then they're ruled by Turks of various types and maybe Persians. No, they're only ruled by Muslims. So that's bad enough, but, uh, but now in the 20th century, they get ruled by Christians. You understand how, how problematic this is? For Arabs, like, we're not an inferior race. We're not a colonial power. This is not Africa or India. That's what they say. Do you understand? That we are a proud people that have a better civilization than you. We're not inferior to Europe. We're superior to Europe. So it was very shocking and, and, and disturbing to them, and still is, that in the latest period of history, the worst thing in their mind should ever happen, which is that they should be taken over by Christians. Educated Arabs in the various states respond by developing a modern concept of Arab nationalism. That wherever Arab is spoken <clears throat> is one big country. So go back to that map for a minute ago, before this. I mean, what, these are really different peoples. But say, oh, no, 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 the theory of Arab nationalism, if you talk the same language, it's all one country. So a similar idea would be America and Canada and South Africa and Britain and all this should be one country because they all speak English. You understand? and other countries around the world like that. Ireland should be all, it's all part of, part of one, one country because they speak English, you see, of a sort. So, uh, wait a second. Um, we, we wouldn't agree to that, but the Arab nationalists insist on it. So it's a question of where you put your emphasis on. Is it where the language is spoken, that's Kovei everything? Or do you say, no, language is interesting, but nationalism and ethnicity is more Kovei, and it becomes a question of this kind of business. Now, this had never existed in the past when there was a great caliphate which ruled over a polyglot empire. Meaning there never was such a thing that all the Arabs got together in a state. What happened was the Arabs conquered and shoved down the throats of everybody in the 6 and 700s. The Arab language and culture and religion. And the people didn't like it. I told you the Persians were strong enough to kick them out, the others weren't. But there never was ever in history such a thing as an Arab country of a large area. But why spoil the beauty of history with facts? The, um, the desire for a great state well, I'll tell you, this. all nationalism, listen to this closely, all nationalism cannot help but be based to some degree or another on myth. Some nationalisms have a, a bigger amount of myth, and some have a lesser amount of myth. Here we're talking 90-10, but what the heck. Now, the desire for a single great state is frustrated by these European-drawn borders. So if you're an Arab nationalist, and this is particularly true in the 20th century, today things are different, it bothers you a lot that Syria and Iraq are two separate countries. That was a fiendish plot on the part of the Europeans to divide them and to fight each other and waste their, 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 their energy on the stupid 
quarrels when really we should be one. You know, to use a Jewish example, Elif Aleph Alfi Havdalas, but you can't, you know, I cannot help but, but notice this uh, similarity, even though it's vastly different. Look at the Haftorah today, <laughs> right? He says there's a constant battle between Judah and Israel, between the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. And the Novi is saying like this, no, Hashem says you should all, the eight Yehuda and the eight Yosef should get together. What are we fighting each other for, right? You, you follow? So I guess it's a different story, but you see, you see the, the, the parallel that I'm talking about over here. The single, any, anyways, I said, um, the desire for a single great straight, state is frustrated by the European drawn borders, which cannot help but develop local patriotisms. So in other words, the British, cleverly or not cleverly, let's go, let's go to the next one. I mean, this guy doesn't ask the British, he just sets up his own kingdom. They give him what we call today Jordan. The British t just decided the, they owed him something from fighting in the First World, so they gave him a country called Jordan. It's a nice deal. And they gave him, who was his brother, this, the two brothers, Abdul and Faisal, they gave him, uh, as a reward for fighting with the British, a country called Iraq, which they invented. No, they invented it, Jordan, and they invented Iraq. So why aren't Jordan and Iraq one big country at least? It's totally because the British decided, you know, <laughs> You don't want two, you know, you want to, you have to give, what should I say, you have to give presents to both brothers. You know the story of a little kid that, they, you know, he's always eating them for himself, so he said, why don't you share something with uh, your two brothers? He gives him one potato, so he breaks them into two, you know. He gives it to the two of them, he didn't give them anything more. So that's how the Arabs look at what the British did over here. Then, in addition to this, there's the problem of Egypt, which I haven't mentioned, because Egypt is an actual country. There has never been in history, think about what I'm about to tell you, there has never been in history a country called Iraq before the British invented it. There has never been in history, this is really interesting what I'm about to say, there has never been in history a country called Syria. Isn't that interesting? There were kingdoms in Syria that fought each other. There's never been a country called Syria. Uh, there's Aram Naraim, there's Aram Damascus, Aram Tsova. If you know your Tanakh, you'll remember when David Amelch beat this Aram, the other Aram joined him you know, and, and saluted him. There has never been in history a country called Jordan. But my friends, there has been in history a country called Egypt. You see my point? They have a long national tradition, even though Egypt wasn't an independent country since Alexander the Great, saw, you know, or, or since Julius Caesar's time, to be more exact. They've never been an independent country. But before that, as we all know, they, the pharaohs were around before Abu Avinu. And so they're a real country. And if that's the case, are they Arabs? Now the Arabs conquered them, and they Arabized them, and they shoved the Arabic uh, language down their throat. But look at this. Here's one of the most important Egyptian intellectuals of the 20th century, blind. And he became a Nobel Prize, a very important person. And what does he say? Uh, intellectual in the Egyptian Renaissance? Uh, as he says over here, Egyptian civilization diametrically opposed to Arabic civilization. Egypt will only progress by reclaiming its pre-Islamic roots. See, he wants to go back to Paro, <laughs> okay? The, uh, no, but I want to tell you something. Um, now, by the way, the from Muslims in Egypt are very angry at this and so forth, but he represents a very strong uh, current in, in educated Egyptians in the 20th century, and he wasn't the only one. Now, unfortunately, it didn't pan out this way. Israel, at the time of Theodor Herzl, at the time of Chaim Weizmann, um, until the 1930s, uh, there were Zionist movements that were very active in Egypt. In Egypt, I repeat, um, there were 70,000 Jews, uh, maybe some of you read recently the new biographies of Avadi Yosef since he passed away, so now they come and you see, you see what a big life there was in Egypt, even though he had a hard time over there. Um, you know, the Jews did well economically, all the rest of it, and it didn't exactly identify itself with the Arabic culture. Now, it came to. It happened eventually. But in the uh, past, and even to some degree in the present, uh, there's a strong idea that, yeah, we talk the same language as the Arabs because they shoved it down our throats, but we're not Arabs. We're vastly excuse me, we're vastly superior to the Arabs and we should have nothing to do with them, they'll just drag us down. So in the interwar years, in the 20s and the 30s, a hothouse environment is created in which Arab intellectuals are in a fervor. Arab intellectuals in, in, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, and Egypt, and all these other places. One thing is clear, there is no room for a Jewish state in the heart of all this in the Arab world. Uh, the Arab Christians and other minorities sort of blend naturally into the Arabic Nationalism simply because it's secular. So if you're a Christian and you live in Syria, oh, you want to be a big Syrian patriot because if you don't talk about Syria, then it'll be the ISIS, you know what I mean? 
then it'll be religious, and then you'll, you'll be a dimmy, you know, a, a second-class citizen. But if you create a secular state, then there'll be equality, hopefully, at, the, at least at the legal level, and uh, that'll be better for you. So uh, the, the Arabic Christians are among the most violent and strong, uh, you know, nationalists and anti-Israel. Oh, my goodness. Even though you and I know today, if Israel goes down, they lose also, but they, they don't see it that way. Jews, by the way, would have done so if not for the rise of Zionism. Get it? Simply because of smart politics. If Jews in Iraq, in Syria, and places like that, had there not been an Israel movement, so to get along, and you lived in in Egypt, wherever, in the 20th century, go with the Arab nationalism, why not? I mean, that'll be good for you too. In 1934, Ben-Gurion, who was the head of the Zionist movement at that time, holds talks with Syrian Arab political intellectuals. He wrote a whole book on it, My, my Conversation with Arab Leaders which he published in 67. Now, these are unproductive. Here's Ben Gurion at that time. Here's Musa Alami, who was a big Palestinian uh, macher. He was uh, the secretary of the uh, high commissioner in the British. He's a highly educated guy. And he, you know, is the shit shach, and he, he has meetings, he arranges meetings for Ben Gurion to go to Syria and talk with this big macher and this Lebanese guy and all the rest. It's not like he didn't know what's going on, but Ben Gurion imagined maybe can t- come to some kind of modus vivendi, agree to a... You help us get a Jewish state, we'll help you get an Arab state, and the Arab state, uh, no, we, <laughs> we don't want a Jewish state, we just want an Arab state, thank you very much. Um, by World War II, it's clear that British and French colonial is not going to last too much longer. Uh, Britain, uh, France was defeated by the, the, the Germans, as you all know, and they emerged very weak, and Britain blew all their money and resources fighting World War II, and Arab intellectuals and political thinkers already start dreaming of an Arab third way. Here's uh, three very important intellectuals, one a Muslim, one a Christian, and one a, a Druze. Uh, he's Druze, he's a Mo- uh, Sunni Muslim, and he is uh, a Christian. And um, they are create the Ba'ath Party, which means that they want to, yes. So they said, they, they, no, no, they say like this. Um, fascism isn't a good match. Communism is not a good match. A democracy is not a good match for the Arabs. Uh, what's left? Socialism is not good match. Arab Arabzach, right? We want our own Arab Zionism, if I can use that term. It should be part socialism, part not socialism, part democracy, part not democracy, part fascism. We, we want to make our own cholent, which, which, no, which, which will work for us. And this will be the magic formula for secular Arab nationalism, which will, first of all, win us our independence and then catapult us to the top of the world because they're intellectuals, so they live in a dream world, you know. And uh, it's very utopian. I mean, you see the writing is very utopian. And it appeals to the Arabs. After the war, the Arabs do gain independence. But they don't gain it all at once. They get it one by one, state by state. Syria uh, became independent in 1945. And then Lebanon. And, uh, you know, Jordan didn't get rid of the British until about four or five years later. Iraq, a couple years after that. It doesn't happen. The, Egypt had a bitter struggle with the British. They only got rid of them in 53, 54, when Nasser came in. It, it didn't happen overnight. And since it didn't happen overnight, so it wasn't possible for all the Arab states to get together in one state. Because each state went in on its own, and as soon as they come on its own, local patriotisms get involved. And if this guy's taking over Syria, then you don't want anybody else. And you don't want to lose his job to somebody else. And next thing you know, you have a bunch of Arab states who were actually against each other as much as, as four. Each one jealously guards its sovereignty. But the Arabs are free. By the time you get to the 50s, the Europeans are gone. It's a euphoria. Everything is going to be great. Uh, no, because the reality kicks in. You get tremendous poverty and tremendous political dysfunction. And worst of all, as we all know, right in the middle of what should be a glorious era, when the Arabs finally, after a thousand years, a thousand years, finally get their independence, Israel. Right? No, that wasn't part of the. <laughs> Nobody foresaw that. Okay, and the birth of Israel happens at the dawn of modern Arab nationalism. Now, again, I'm spending tonight trying to show you how the world looks from their glasses, right? But these are our neighbors. So they see it the way I'm describing you. Israel happened at the wrong time. Make sure you get that. The, um, that, it, 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 you know, it, it, it just, it, it doesn't fit in, you understand? Uh, it's not the way it was supposed to go. The way it was supposed to go is, we had a period of European colonialism, finally got rid of them, we got our own thing, and we'll try to fix it, our, our own problems. This is the first time in Arab history that they lost Arab territory. 
Okay? They didn't have Persia really, so it's not Arab. But Arab, as far as Arab speaking lands, the Turks were ruling them for hundreds of years, and before them were the other types of Turks, and the Mamluks, and this and that and the other. They were, understand closely what I'm saying. They, they were ruled by foreigners, even the British, if you want to look at it that way, or the French. But they never took their kaka from them. The Jews didn't rule Israel. They kicked the Arabs out, one way or another. Or that's the way the story ended. They actually took their stuff away from them. So the Arabs, they lost land. You follow? They didn't lose land under the Turks. They didn't lose land under the British and the French. They didn't lose land when they were ruled by some other empire. Right? They were just ruled by somebody, but they're there when, they, when it's over. Here they lose it in a permanent way. So this is really very insulting them. We, we Arabs, we don't lose land. That's not what we do. It's never happened in our history. And to the Jews, those scumbags, right? If people made fun of the Arabs, can you imagine how much the Arabs historically made fun of the Jews? Because the Arabs were already a master and conquering race. And the Jews, because they lived in, among the Arabs, had to always be very nebuchy. No, no, I mean it. You had to turn the other steak. In an Arab country, if Arab insults a Jew, you got to take it, you got to turn the other cheek, or they'll kill you. You understand? And they beat you up, and so on and so forth. And because the Jews have to live that kind of existence, they have lost for a thousand years, over a thousand years, any kind of respect from Arab culture. The Jews always less than less. I think I mentioned before, but I'll mention it again. I know the, I saw a historian who was writing about the 1500s, talking about, or 1600s, talking about a Jew who wanted to convert to Islam. And the Muslim guy said, guess, we don't take, Islam is a, is a high-class club. We don't take a Jew. Go, no, that's what he told him. Go and convert to Christian, and then a month later, convert to us. <laughs> no, 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 but what, is it, what, what does that tell you in terms of cultural messages? And now these guys have set up a state, and they've taken our land away and kicked our people out? We're the great ones. They're the inferior ones. How did that happen? And so what happens when the irresistible force of immovable object? You understand? What happens when your ideology runs into scientific facts, it's, it, it, it's a real problem. Uh, this is why the Arabs view Zionism as something particularly fiendish. Right? Napoleon came and left. Allen came and left the British. He didn't leave. <laughs> right? The Jews stayed. They set up their own country. They kicked them out. You understand? And the Arabs that are there are, are held in, in, in bondage. So what, what, what's going on? Uh, it, it's, it's a real problem. Now, in the 50s, as we get to where we are, Nasser comes to power in 1952, 1954, and he's the apotheosis of Arab nationalism. Uh, it, can't, it doesn't get better than that. First of all, he's from Egypt. So if he identifies with Arab nationalism, it means that Egypt is signing on the team. Right? He's not Taha Hussein, who says the Arabs are, like I say, sand jocks, would have nothing to do with them. Egypt is higher class than that. We just have a same language. Any more than a Britisher is going to say, you know, we're, we're, we're like Irish. <laughs> it's not going to happen, right? Uh, Nasser isn't like that. He writes his famous book, or his friend writes the book for him, called The Philosophy of the Revolution, in which he says Egypt is an African country, and Egypt is an Egyptian country, and Egypt is an Arab country. But Egypt is Egypt. It's, the, it's always number one. So if it's an African country, it's the number one country of all the Africans. If it's an Arab country, it's no one can And Egypt, of course, we're number one because in Egypt, you know, I mean, no, we've been around since Paro and all that sort of thing, you know. So uh, he, and he, and by the way, he speaks this way on the radio and he talks about the glorious Arabs and the glorious past and we're going to get the glorious present back and the only people stopping him are fiendish, bad people of all type of East and West and Jewish and the other. I mean, if you're an Arab, you like, to, you like to hear this kind of stuff. You get it? And so, to Arabs, Nasser is the face, not only of pride, but of progress and reform, which he wishes to make synonymous with Arab nationalism. I told you. Uh, he was against slavery, for example, which was still an issue. Um, he's opposed by the very conservative Saudi monarchy. Uh, he was the intelligent one. The one before him, King Saud, was a stupid, but, the, but Faisal was the opposite of stupid. And uh, it was in his time that the constant criticism of Nasser on the radio finally got him to do something he didn't want to do, which is abolish slavery in 1964. People don't know that, okay? Because America didn't want to say anything about it because the gas was 20 cents. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's what it is. I'll tell you, I told you last week, they still had official slavery, they still do now, but now it's not official, but that time it was official slavery, and the official slavery in, up to 1964 was 90% black and 10% white. That's, that's how it went. But people didn't want to talk about it. 
You know, they still send slave kidnapping expeditions and all that in the 50s. But Eisenhower didn't want to talk about it. You see? Because the gas is 20 cents. No, 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 uh, you know, this is, there's what they say in public and what they really do. All right? So this makes Nasser, if anything, the leader of a fraction within the Arab world. And there will emerge in the late 50s and the 60s two camps, pro-Nasser, anti-Nasser. Okay, and Israel's got to maneuver within them. But it's pro-Nasser and anti-Nasser. And the leader of the anti-Nasser is Saudi Arabia. The Saudis and their team say, stop talking about Arab nationalism. That's Reform Judaism, right? No, no, talk about Islam. You understand? Um, they're more into that. He, Islam is a more effective way to oppose Israel. And he was right. We know this today. He said, Israel, as long as you talk about Arab nationalism, Israel could team up with the Nigeria or something like that, or, or Indonesia, because even they're a Muslim country, but they're not Arabs, and therefore you can talk to them about economic cooperation and things like that. But if you talk about Islam, 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 then you kill any chance for them having any shaykh with Israel. As you know, in our time, this has emerged as reality. So he actually was right. In the 50s, this wasn't followed, and that was good for Israel. You follow? In the ben Gurion era, what I just described did not happen yet, and that gave Israel a lot more room to, to uh, maneuver. It was Nasser was predominating. I can only say this in hindsight. That's what historians do. And, and in the 50s, they said, oh, vey, Nasser is a terrible problem. Looking back, <laughs> he was better than what came after him. This is like, uh, you know, what the Gemara said, don't, you know, be Ms. Paolo for the Shalom Malchus. You don't know what's going to take place afterwards. It's a, it's a crazy world. After the Yom Kippur War, when Arab nationalism, after his third or fourth defeat, was discredited, so then Faisal's way will predominate. It'll become very much more Islamic to Israel's misfortune and to the misfortune of a country called the United States of America, as you see over here. Right? And to the misfortune, by the way, of the Muslim world. This is the Taliban, these other guys hanging, this happens all the time. You know? Notice these are Muslims killing Muslims. And it's because the Arab national thing was put aside, and now you have the ISIS, and you have the Taliban, and you have the Al-Qaeda, and all the others. And they're shooting, I mean, I could fill the screen, as you know, with 100 pictures like this and more. And by the way, to the misfortune of the Saudis themselves, because out of this emerged Osama bin Laden and his followers who went over to Saudi Arabia, do they not? So they created their own monster. It was the bad luck of the Arabs that exactly at the same time that their nationalism turned white hot, it was their misfortune that Israel led by Ben-Gurion, whose Jewish nationalism was white hot. That's what makes the 50s so interesting. Right? The essence of the Ben-Gurion era was the overwhelming consensus in Israel in favor of an un uncompromising Jewish nationalism, the kind that in many respects mirrors the hostility the Arab world feels towards it. This drills me. You get what I'm saying? It's not the way today. Today you have a strong left, and you have a lot of uh, Jews who are self-critical, and you know, maybe the Arabs are right. Uh, unfortunately, go to the campuses. You know, all the Jewish kids are joining the BZD and, 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 and worse. Right? It didn't happen in the 50s, and certainly didn't happen in Israel. There basically was hardly a left. Uh, the influence of Ben-Gurion um, and the government resources he had at that time dominated the Israeli culture. Um, a very important factor is that prior to 1965, uh, the government owned the news. <laughs> you get it? The TV and radio. Uh, so in Ben-Gurion's time, he wasn't stupid. Uh, you know, Walter Cronkite works for me. <laughs> Right? No, but, but, which, which, by the way, is true in many countries. I'll, I'll just give you one example. In France, the government owns the news. You get it? And it's not independent. In England, it's theoretically independent with the BBC, but in, in, uh, in France, it's not. And so you're not going to hear a strong, fundamental criticism of the regime from French TV or radio. So in, in Ben-Gurion's time, I'm only mentioning this because you know, Jews are super hypercritical. And if you would have the news at that time, the radio and later the TV, going against the government, so that would weaken the national resolve because that's what happens when you have this kind of free press. You didn't have a free press in that way. Basically, the only paper that ever attacked Ben Gurion from the left was Haaretz, which has a readership, no question about it, but uh, isn't uh, you know the dominant force. Most Israelis at that time, like today, get the news from the radio. You know, in the 50s. I told you when they had the rubber ducky thing incident. You know, every hour in the, in the, the news junkies, you know, and the, and the, and the radio works for Ben Gurion. And so, uh, what is the feeling among the overwhelming majority of the masses in Israel in the Ben Gurion period? Heck with the Arabs. 
the whole bunch of murderers that cut our throats. It's a good thing you keep them far away. If they kill one of us, kill 10 of them. You know, it's, it, it, those kind of feelings. If the Arabs are violent towards Israel, Ben Gurion is violent towards them, as we've seen. And his spirit inspires Moshe Dayan and the Sharon and all that kind of business. It is an era of public support, overwhelming public support in Israel for very bloody reprisal, reprisal raids. You understand? When, 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 uh, when Israel, as I told you last year, you know, blew up this town, Akibi and the others, so the whole world went crazy and Haaretz went crazy, but everybody else said, good, hit them twice. Because they're murderers. They come to Kfar Chabad and shoot children. You know, all this kind of, it, it, it is what it is. And so um, it's an era of public support for reprisal rates. It's an era of overwhelming public support in Israel for the military government over the Israeli Arabs. In the years I'm talking about, in the 50s, 50, 57 to 61, the Arabs live under, a, under the control of the Israeli army. You understand what I'm saying? If you go up north, which is the majority of the Arab population in Israel, the Galil, in Akko and in the, all the territories in there. If you're Arab, you can't travel outside of your town without a special pass by the government. You can't get a job without a special pass by the government. You can't teach in a school without getting a heter from the Shin Bet. You can't do, I'll talk about this next week. I mean, and, and, and it's very non-democratic. Now they do vote, but the army does look at you how you vote, right? And uh, it's very non-democratic. The overwhelming majority of the Israeli public has no problem with this whatsoever. You get it? Well, you've got to keep them there because they'll come and they'll, 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 they'll rise in Shechta. The overwhelming uh, majority is in favor of the demonization of the Arabs in the, in the Israeli culture and in the Israeli uh, media and all that kind of stuff. The overwhelming majority of the Israeli culture in Ben Gurion's time is all in favor of no give on the question of borders and on the right of return. Right? Which you to know today is a, it's, it's a much trickier, trickier business. You do not find in any significant group in the Ben Gurion era, especially when. In, in the late 50s, when he was talking in charge, that people like, oh, let's get back to the part of the Negev in order to get a peace treaty with Egypt and all this kind of stuff, or let's let in, uh, a signi- as, as Kennedy and, the, and Eisenhower would have led to 100, 200,000 Arab refugees. No give, thank you. Right? You give me, then I'll give you. We'll talk. Till then, you say no, I say no twice. And again, this was uh, Arab propaganda gets zero traction in Israel. They used to listen to it, they have the Arab... Uh, TV shows in, in Hebrew and in, uh, and, in, uh, and in Arabic and all this kind of stuff. Gets, now, it gets traction among the Arabs in Israel, but it gets no traction among the Jews. Matter of fact, Ephraim Kishon, the famous uh, humorist, has a famous uh, article, I remember from the late 50s, Ben Gurion's time, he says, I'm listening to the Syrian show, la, 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 it's a great song, and all the rest. Only afterwards I find, let's kill the Jews twice and three times, you know. <laughs> Meaning the, 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 the lyrics were pretty bloody, but it doesn't mean anything to him. Because it's just theirs, you know. Of course they're all murderers, and that's naturally they're going to sing. So that, that's the way it goes. The left in the Ben-Gurion area is emasculated in Israel. You probably know uh, who Martin Buber was. I bet you none of you know who Rebbe Ben-Yaman was. There was a tiny group of intellectuals on what we would call the left who say, no, we should be more forgiving, force giving towards the Arabs. We should be more accommodating in terms of taking refugees. We are too stark and too harsh, all the rest of it. No, yeah, but yeah, they wrote for each other. You get it? And, uh, and Ben-Gurion had no problem with it. Believe me, when Martin Buber came in the room, Ben-Gurion stood up for him and says, you're older than I am. And, I mean it. And uh, things like, because he, he's not going anywhere. You understand? A philosophy professor at the Hebrew University. Among graduate students, if you're part of this group, so then you go to the coffee clutches in Rechavia and places like that, and you talk about how bad Ben-Gurion and all the rest is. But it doesn't mean anything for 99% of the population out there. So basically what I'm trying to say is that Ben-Gurion carried out the Jabotinsky policy. Jabotinsky gave a famous speech about the Iron Wall. And he says, listen, if we wait for the Arabs to love us, it'll never happen. Therefore, we have to establish in Israel, if necessary, build an Iron Wall around it until they get used to us, and then we take the Iron Wall down. Because even Jabotinsky said, listen, in the end, we want to live in peace with everybody, but we want, but we want our own, right? So if they make a real peace, fine. The difference between me and you, what makes me civilized and makes you uncivilized is you want to kill me, I don't want to kill you. But if you want to kill me, I want to put up an iron wall. So Ben-Gurion was on the left, so to speak, but he carried out, if I can use it, the policies of the, of the right. Um, the political geography of the Ben-Gurion era is therefore fascinating and is a key to everything I just said. Ben-Gurion, as you know, is the head of the Mapai party. The Mapai is associated with the left. It's a socialist party. Mifleget Pole Eretz Yisrael. Right? It's associated with socialism, but really it's the party of the, of the center. 
Right? In his time, they occupied the center of the spectrum. The Mapai under Ben Gurion's time, pretty doggone nationalistic. It is Poli Eretz Yisrael, but the primacy is on Eretz Yisrael. Poli is secondary. You understand? Uh, that is the essence of its difference between the Mapai and the parties to the left of Mapai. They have Mapam, for example. So uh, Mapai is Poli Eretz Yisrael, Mapam is Mephlegi Poli Muchedet. There's no mention of Eretz Yisrael. It's all about the workers and socialism. And uh, so if you're the Papa, you say, I'm in favor of socialism, but only if it helps the Jewish, only in such a way it helps the Jewish uh, nationalism. Uh, so what I'm trying to show you is the, the socialist world is dom dominated by the Papai party, who used to get 40, 45 seats, something like that, 40, and 59, they got the 47 seats. The Papa got 16, 17, you know, m m much, much less. You get it? So the dominant force in the politics is on the left, the Communist Party, which did exist in Israel in the late 50s, they only get voted by the Arabs. I mean, there's a few crazy Jewish communists here and there, but the overwhelming majority of votes gets by the Arabs, which means they're marginalized. You know, nobody cares what they say. Ben-Gurion, as a matter of policy, successfully sought in the 1950s to co-opt the Mapam and Achdud Avodah into a coalition. Here's one of the posters from that time. This is wonderful. Here's from the Mapam. So he said, we don't want to be part of Coalitia, you know, it's a coalition. When we're part of a Goalitia, Goal means disgusting, right? <laughs> right? Which you can see over here, there's Ben Gurion, and there, there's a guy with a hat, so he's religious, you follow? And here's somebody from the uh, Liberal Party, you know, from the capitalists. We want a Poalitia, right? For the workers, okay? Where everybody's wearing uh, the kibbutz uniform. That's nice for propaganda. That didn't get too much votes, I'll tell you that right now. Um, in 49, by the first election, and in 51, by the second election, Ben-Gurion insisted that the Mapam has to stay out of the government. They're dangerous because they were too pro-Russia and too infatuated with communism. But by 1955, when they had the elections over there, the Mapai lost a lot of seats and they only got 40 because of the Kessner trial. And also, by this time, the Mapam was disillusioned because of all the Arab raids into Israel that the Soviet Union, although it's a good country, isn't... God anymore, right? They were demoted from God to a saint. So uh, Ben Gurion said like this: "I want the Mapam to come into the government." So it was a it was a big change in Israeli politics. I want to bring them into the government, so I you know to co-opt them, so to speak. They should be because after all, the Mapam had this big, very socialist ideology. But remember, as far as patriotism is concerned, all the big all the big fighters in the Palmach were from the Mapam. You understand? Uh, the head of Achtud Avada, also same kind of party, the head was a Yigal alone. So Ben Gurion said like this, what are you guys Come on in, you know, so we'll fight in the, you know, like Jews do, we'll fight in the cabinet, but we really agree with more than we do. So if he did succeed in doing this, and he did do so, and the Mapam and the Mapai stayed connected till today, actually, um, if this is true, then what it means is he silenced them as a left-wing criticism of his government. You follow? You're not going to see from the Mapam strong arguments against the military government over the Arabs. Strong arguments because Ben Gurion is having too unyielding of a policy. The Mapam and Achdur Avada were part of the government that fought the Sinai campaign, for example. You see? And so Ben Gurion was able to craft an Israeli body politic that was overwhelmingly in favor of his harsh policies as he, as he saw it. The uh, cabinet of 55 59, as I say before, had a significant. Um, elements of the socialist movement. So it's basically all the left-wingers minus the communists were part of the established part of the government. And uh, in this case, he really emasculated the pro-Arab left. I mean, guys like Martin Buber were, you know, looking at like weirdos, you understand? Now he says that German Jewish intellectually doesn't understand, you know, whatever, but it's not real. Um, since his government includes all the Zionist leftist parties, so who is the leader of the opposition in the parliament in the time of Ben-Gurion? Malcolm Bacon. <laughs> Malcolm Bacon's not going to say, oh, you're too, you're too far to the right, you're too harsh against the Arabs. I mean, Bacon is more contemptuous and more unyielding to the Arabs than Ben-Gurion. So you, you understand this is a fundamental dynamic. If you don't understand, you don't understand how Israel operated in those years. The, the, oh, there was a huge consensus, and there was no active opposition against the policies that I just laid out. Yes, the Arabs are an irresistible force, but Israel is an immovable object. <laughs> you follow? They're not giving in nothing. And the overwhelming majority of the Israeli body politic it has a consensus, a strong consensus of these matters. They may fight over religion and the state, you know, yeshivas. They may fight over the Lavon affair. They may fight, but not over what really, as they see, not over what really counts. Um, 
the fact of a quote-unquote leftist government pursuing strong nationalist policies with an opposition coming from the right wing will be a basic feature of Israel during its first 30 years. Okay? Until, until Begin wins. In other words, under Ben-Gurion, Sharet, Yitzhak Rabin, Golda Meir, Levi Eshkol, all those guys had a situation I just described to you. The opposition is coming from Begin. All the left-wing parties are part of the government. They're all pursuing Ben-Gurionist type policies, more or less. So there didn't even exist within Israel any kind of significant, r real voice in the, in the Knesset and in, in, in places like that to question the immovable object. To question the very strong policy I just laid out. Only after Menachem Begin wins in 1977 will a strong leftist opposition arise in Israel with very complex results. Right? Because Begin became the prime minister, eventually you get a situation, as you can see over here, where the leaders of the Ben-Gurion party, because that's what uh, Shimon Peres and, and Yitzhak Rabin were, they were leaders of the Ben-Gurion party, because now they're in the opposition, and they were to the left, so they start attacking the government from the left, so that created, for, for the first time ever, the fact that I just described to you, which is there emerges strong arguments. Oh, you've got to be more giving to the Palestinians, as you see in this picture. You've got to be less harsh. You've got to be this, that, and the other. Uh, didn't exist prior to 1977. In, in this regard, in this very narrow regard, uh, we see with hindsight, the election of the Likud in Machen Beg was a disaster. You get what I'm saying? Because, because until that happened, there was no left in the real sense. But after that happened, the short second merge. I mean, look over here. Uh, he was a general in the Palmach. Shimon Peres, you know what he was doing over there. They had, they had very different identities prior to 1977. Agreed? They had very different. These are two, uh, what should I say, spear carriers of Ben-Gurionism. <laughs> Literally. Yes, I mean, he actually, Peres created the spear. And, 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 and Rabin is through it. I mean, they, you know, they were really uh, very strong nationalists. And then afterwards, it changes. So you never know the unexpected results of the electoral process. The Sinai, now, from the point of view of the Arabs, this isn't right. It should be that our overwhelming force against the Jewish should force the Zionist state to crack from within because of the hatred and pressure exerted from the, all the neighboring states without example. And it doesn't happen. Right? As a matter of fact, the Sinai campaign totally frustrates the Arab nationalists because it seems like Israel isn't going anywhere very soon. So you understand what I'm saying? When the intellectuals talk to each other, so they say the overwhelming power of the, of the idea of the Arab nationalist movement and the Ba'athist party and the Arab third way, this itself will eradicate the last vestiges of colonialism within the Middle East, blah, blah, blah. But what, but what do you do about that? <laughs> you understand? Uh, reality gets in the way. And so it's not great. And then it gets worse. In the late 50s, they find that Israel gets a bomb. <laughs> That's definitely not on the Arab playbill, right? This is not part of the play. So what happens? And so what happens in the late 50s is they don't concentrate on Israel. They concentrate on Algeria, which receives their main efforts in the years 57 to 61. Okay? Here's uh, De Gaulle. Right? Here's De Gaulle visiting Algiers trying to give him the bad news that uh, France... Now, in the first round, he said, we're going to support the French Algerians and, uh, you know, be Mechazic and all the rest of it. In the, in the long run, in 1960, he gave in. Um, 57 to 61 are the peak years of the French fighting the Algerians. Consequently, they are the peak years of Israel friendship with, with France. You get it? Because they were always fighting the Algerians, they needed anti-Arab support. Right? The Arab states, like Nasser, is all supplying the Algerians with weapons and trying to undermine France everywhere. And Israel has good intelligence resources and things like this. So the maximum years of Israel-French relations are 57 to 61. Those are the years, as I pointed out, when Shimon Peres gets the A-bomb from them. That, that's why it happened. But in the long run, as you know, um, and here I'm going to end on something uh, rather, uh, once again, you know, the unintended consequences. Israel has a respite. In 5761, there was no pressure in the international community to solve the refugee problem, to fix the borders. I told you, Eisenhower had his mind on other things. But eventually, in 1962, the Arabs prevail in Algeria. And then with Algeria past them, so they've taken over everything that's Arab, with one exception. The Arab nationalists 
will turn to the remaining problem as they see it, which is the problem of Palestine. The years after 62, 62, 66, we'll see the birth of the PLO, which has never happened before. It will create an unprecedentedly dangerous situation for Israel. Huh? Now, the problem is, by that time, Ben-Gurion will be gone, and he'll be followed by someone nowhere near as eloquent or clear-sightedly clear forceful in making the case against the Arabs, against the Palestinians. Because Ben-Gurion was a good talker, you know, especially in this regard. Eshkol is a nice guy, and I know they write books now to try to build him up and all the rest of it. He wasn't that great. And he certainly was no inspiring leader in Israel's existential struggle against what I'm talking about over here. Ben-Gurion was a stark guy. You, you follow his speeches, he could articulate in ways that I can't do while we're right and they're wrong and they can all jump in a lake. You understand? So it would be, no, no, no. So the, the period after 61 will be the beginning of Israel on the defensive, which is not a good thing. Those who pointed to Ben-Gurion's many mistakes, and he certainly made them, will miss him in the new dangerous environment, which never existed in the years I'm talking about. The Arabs will be stark, but the Israelis will increasingly go peacenik. Right? But it did not happen in 57 to 61. So therefore, these years have a very uh, specific character, and we are done for tonight. What's that? Oh, that's a long story. That's a long story.